Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and I'm going to be covering material in chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12 is dealing with global marketing, and chapter 13 is dealing with distribution and supply chain management. Both of these are very, very important topics, particularly when you talk about the four Ps, the idea of promotion is extremely important. And when you go overseas, there are the four Ps, but there are a number of different elements that you have to deal with. Now, for your project, you're assessing a foreign market. Let's say, for example, I'm a company and I hire your company, a consulting firm, to do an assessment for the country that you're researching. And let's say that I have an idea that I may want to enter that market. Now, you as the consulting firm will have to go and conduct that assessment, which means you would have to make a number of visits to officials, trade officials. You would have to make visits to people in the uh, commerce, the, uh, the local business community. They have all types of um, you know, of, of trade, uh, trade experts, people on the ground that can help uh, you to get an idea of how to acclimate to that market. When I've been on trips overseas with groups of faculty members, we're often briefed by a number of different people in the commercial industry, including the American embassy. And they give us all the the different rules and the regulations, uh, things like taxes, uh, repatriation of capital, currency controls, all of these things are, of course, very important. But when you are marketing abroad, there are a different set of rules in terms of what's accepted, which also includes culture. Now, many of those uh, elements that you're researching, the political, legal, economic, financial, social, cultural, technological, human resource management, competitive environment is also another one. Geographic is another one. In your assessment, you have to give me a geographic setting. Where is this country located exactly? Is it a landlocked country? Does it have a shoreline? How long is the shoreline? Where is it in proximity to other nations? Uh, the, this makes a big difference. In terms of chapter 13, when you talk about shipping, getting your product from point A to point B. So looking at the international markets, let's be honest that a company will not consider going overseas unless there's an incentive. Why would you go overseas? What are some of the reasons? Well, essentially, the reason is that you want to expand your market reach and you want an opportunity to gain greater revenue. That's the main reason. There may be some other strategic reasons, such as looking at the competition. And because competition overseas may have expanded, then they have legitimized that market, which makes it ripe for competition. One of the other reasons that you might seek going abroad is because your factor, factors of production may be uh, cheaper. We're not only talking about labor, but we're also talking about materials. The raw materials that you need or through procurement, your suppliers, the materials that you need to make the products that you're making, and thus, Moving production overseas can give you access to those markets in that region. So those are some basic reasons when you start talking about market potential. And what you do when you look at market potential, you look at things like your demographics. You look at population. You look at population density. You look at age, age distribution. You look at income, income distribution. Uh, you look at propensity to save. Uh, you look at a lot of these, these elements that gives you an idea of market potential.
And then you also look at sales potential, where you have to make it a little bit more narrow to that market that is going to be interested in uh, purchasing your product. So sales potential is defined in the book as the percentage of a market potential. So it is a percentage of the total that a specific company expects to sell in a specific international market. Following, you have different types of markets. Now, when we talk about digital marketing, we always talk about this matrix where you have B to C, which is business to consumer. You have C to B, consumer to business. You have B to B, which is business to business. And you have C to C, which is consumer to consumer. And these are all elements when you talk about the exchange of products in the market. So you have your consumer market, where you have your normal types of products, food, clothing, transportation, and then your services. You have your business market, your industrial market. We talk about B2B again. Equipment and machinery, supplies, lubricants, consulting services, cleaning services are all in that category. But then you have another element that's covered in some classes, B to G. So you have some government. Some governments need airplanes. They need uniforms. They need other types of electronic equipment that may go inside of an airplane. And so you have government contractors. So you have a, a various markets that... Uh, when you go overseas, you have uh, to look at these options in terms of what is the segment that I'm after? Who are the people that I'm targeting? What types of products do I have? And thus, you can make the right choice in terms of which uh, market that you're seeking. So how do you make these decisions? Well, again, I mentioned that you look at the demographics. Here they talk about population, income levels, GDP per capita, which is, which is GDP divided by the population. Now, what does that assume? It assumes that you have equal distribution, right? Because you're dividing GDP by the population. Now, there are some caveats. When you divide... GDP by the population, it assumes an equal distribution. But such a society, society does not exist. There is no society that exists currently that has an equitable distribution. Some countries may have more of an equitable distribution than others, but you don't have a country that has equitable distribution. There tends to be a lot of uh, segments. And then you have uh, of course, this um, in grad school, what they call a Lorenz curve, which gives you the idea, the uh, percentage of income versus the percentage of population. So it's these two axes that you measure. A 1% of the population would control 1% of the income. 2% of the population should control 2% of the income. 50% should control 50% of the income. That would be an equitable distribution. That would be a perfect uh, correlation. But typically, you have, for example, in a lot of countries, you have the top 5% that may control 50 to 60% of the nation's wealth. Uh, as you find in this country where you have the top 1% that controls a very large percentage of the national income. So you have income distribution. You have the um, age, when you start talking about the age distribution, how young is your population? In the other side of outsourcing, we, we saw a case study on India 
And they had a distinction of not only being um, primarily a vegetarian nation, 40%, don't eat beef. Those are two very uh, uh, uncommon things. And also predominantly Hindu. But what is the other thing? Is that their population is very young, very young, with over 50% under the age of 25. And so when you look at that distribution, you're thinking, okay, what kind of products am I going to market to India? You might think in terms of demographics, maybe I'll go after the, the younger generation because their incomes are cre increasing and they have more buying power. So those are may, may be some things that you'll look at. You'll look at the nation's ethnicity and religions. I just mentioned Hinduism. And India also has other major religions such as Buddhism and Islam. India represents the second largest um, Muslim population uh, on the planet behind which country? And you probably cannot guess this, but the largest Muslim country in terms of population on the planet is Indonesia. It is the largest Muslim country in the world. India has the second largest, and you have other large uh, nations of Muslim populations, uh, such as Nigeria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Turkey. Uh, most of these Muslim uh, adherents are not in the Middle East. And most of them do not speak Arabic as their first language. That's a misnomer that um, we often hear about Muslims. We think about the Middle East. We think about Arabs. But, of course, the Muslim uh, population is uh, exceedingly diverse. And these are some things that you would know if you're researching a, a country that's in that region. It's important to know um, these these uh, tidbits, and these are things you would uh, find out uh, in your, your research. You also want to look at where that market is situated. Is it in an urban area? Is it in a rural area? Uh, this makes a difference for a lot of reasons, most notably distribution. If you're in an urban area, typically you're going to have a higher population density you're going to have more of a market reach because you're able to reach more people through the media or say through a billboard or through some advertisement than you would if you're in a rural area where things are very much spread out. So again, these are some things that you would look at in terms of your research. Looking at the per capita GDP here, you have Qatar at the top, 102100 dollars per year per uh, per person. Uh, I have traveled to Qatar. It is a very wealthy country. Uh, when I traveled there more than 10 years ago, they were still building. There were a lot of building projects. They were uh, using a lot of Filipino uh, workers. A lot of migrant labor were building these structures. And I talked to a former colleague, former SBI colleague, who's a professor there at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, I actually went to Qatar to visit. And he was saying, the last time you were here, Qatar has changed by leaps and bounds. And he furthermore said, you wouldn't recognize the place. Uh, and you can just see the potential that that country has because they have their awash in uh, oil uh, revenue and a country that is uh, about in terms of population, the same as Jamaica, around 2.7 million, 2.8 million. So a very small country and uh, very wealthy. You'll notice some of the other countries on the list, Liechtenstein, Monaco, Luxembourg. Those are some of the, the countries that were mentioned in the giant beast uh, that is called the uh, global economy, the, the video that we watched. And these are offshore uh, territories that that um, are a safe haven for a lot of uh, tax shelters, not to mention Switzerland, which you see as number seven on that list in terms of uh, wealth. And then you have some others, Singapore, 
Uh, I've been to Singapore. I've been to Norway. Countries are doing very well. It's very expensive in those places, but certainly the cost of living um, um, would would um, would probably negate any type of uh, savings that you think you'll have uh, because of the exchange rate. Uh, in addition, you have some some of the others. Brunei, you might not uh, know much about, a Buddhist nation that is in Asia. And I believe at one time they had the richest man in the world. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, then you have some other, the usual countries. The United States is, is punching in at number nine. The Netherlands and then Canada, our northern neighbor, are also in the top, um, the upper echelon. I might also say, and if you will allow me to go back just um, a couple of slides, I want to say something about demographics, or not just demographics, but I, I, I want to point to another metric that is often used to assess nations. You look at demographics, you look at things like GDP per capita, you look at income distribution, but there is a, a particular metric that's very important. Uh, and if you will allow me to show you, it is called the Human Development Index. And this was something I remember from graduate school and then they came out with these, these uh, reports every year and they would update these reports. And what these reports did was it looked at the social health of a country. So it not only were you to look at the economic stability of a country, you were also to look at the social stability of a country. So what is this Human Development Index? And this is the link that I'm showing you here to the United Nations Development Program that puts out these reports. And here, if you uh, read under the heading that the HDI was created to emphasize that people and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a country, not the economic growth alone. The HDI can also be used to question national policy choices, asking how two countries with the same level of GNI, gross national income, per capita can end up with different human development outcomes. So what is this HDI? What does it consist of? You see down the bottom, it is measuring uh, health is one, knowledge attainment uh, is another, and also standard of living. So if you look, I'm going to go to another website. And if we go down on this site, it has the same points here, which they took from the organization, long healthy life, access to education, and a decent standard of living. So how exactly is that defined? If we look at further down, we'll see a color-coded map that gives you an indication of some of these metrics and they even have graphs. So of course the United States and Canada look very good uh, at 0 0.93, 0 0.92 for the United States. This is out of one, zero to one. And if you look at some of these other regions, they don't fare so well. Brazil at 0.76. You look at some of the African nations, 0 0.4, 0 0.437, point. 3.7, Russia is 0.82, India is 0.64, Australia is 0.94. So you see uh, how the rankings play out. They also have tables in alphabetical order, other sources, life expectancy you see, years of schooling, gross national income per capita. You also have things such as maternal mortality, infant mortality, um, uh, literacy rates, 
are all part of this, these uh, metrics. So let's look at a few other things before I move forward. They have a lot of graphs here showing you how the Human Development in Index has evolved over time. And you see how some of these nations had developed. Going forward, and you, you actually see South Korea at the top. And you see the progress they have made. So you have a lot of valuable information here. And then you could actually click and it takes you down to these categories, life expectancy. And again, these are color coded. We have a life expectancy here of 78.9 years. Canada is 82.4. Europe has, as you can see, um, a lot of longevity, as does Australia. But if you look at the African continent, you have a lot of countries who have a life expectancy of 60 years, 60. In Latin America, about 10, 15 years more. So these are things you have to look at. If you're doing an assessment of a country, these are the factors that you would examine. I just wanted to make mention of that. So how do you get your research? Now the book gives you these ways of getting your research. They give some useful tables, which we will go over, but you have marketing research and we all know from marketing different elements of research. You've got your surveys, you've got your interviews, you've got your focus groups, you've got consumer panels, you have a number of different ways in which you can collect that data. You also have observational techniques that you can use for exploratory studies, which then you can form a, a hypothesis to test uh, in a more rigorous way. So you have that element of marketing intelligence. Uh, you also have information collected over a period of time so that you can develop patterns uh, and you can uh, maybe develop some type of framework for addressing that particular market. Going forward, this is the information needed. So it's a lot of information. If you were doing your project for real, say you were the consulting company and you're doing Let's say you're doing Singapore and someone wanted an assessment of Singapore and they wanted to know what is the prospects of me doing business in Singapore in let's say six months to a year? What are the prospects? You would go, you would condu you'd conduct your research after having traveled over there. But what are you looking at? You're looking at all of these things, examples of information needed from a marketing information system. Packaging, marketing, labeling. You're looking at regulations there. Psychographic information. Here we're talking about attitudes, beliefs, opinions, personalities, socio-demographic. Now here you're talking about where people are situated. Population density. Industry data sales. Uh, specific perception of products, a whole wide range of information that you, you would need to collect normally. Now we're doing a stripped down version of a much more comprehensive model. Uh, and that's just to give you a taste of how this research would go. You have a matrix here. You have internal information that you can gather, both secondary data that you can find internally to the company, financial and accounting data that you've collected over a period of time, and then you have external secondary data, which most of you collect. For this project, you have to do journal articles that will make up the 
these environmental factors or uncontrollables. And you would most likely get those from periodicals, from online publications. You can get them from newspapers and bulletins, other kinds of published reports. Now, primary, we know the difference between secondary and primary, right? Primary is data that are collected for the first time. So you have to conduct your surveys, your interviews. You have to conduct your own study. That means your data are not only original, but it's customized to suit your problem precisely. Unlike secondary data, which is available, but it might not fit your particular situation. So you have internal primary data that you can collect through company marketing research department, companies sales force may have that data from their sales. And then you have external primary data, trade shows, going to trade shows and actually getting information from players in that industry, conventions and meetings, company advertising agencies, and other channels of distribution and consultants like yourself. So these are the ways that you can collect and procure information so you can make those types of assessments. This is called a marketing intelligence system. The big question here, we're almost at the half hour mark. The big question when you're going abroad, should you standardize or should you adapt? You've got a couple different choices to make. If you standardize, that means you take your product as is. Maybe some minor changes, and some will say if you just change the language, that's not considered adaptation. Those are just basic baseline things that you have to do. But it says here, marketing strategies used in international markets are the same as those used in the firm's domestic market. So things such as your pricing strategy may be similar, your promotion may be similar, and you may even use the same slogans. But in adaptation, that means you have to look at all those factors, the ones that you're researching through the journal articles, and you have to make some adjustments to your product based upon the differences between your home country and the country that you're going to. Obviously, we've studied cross-cultural uh, business, and we understand that when you go into another environment, there are some differences, which means that you may have to make some adjustments to your four Ps. You may have to make some adjustments to pricing. You may have to make some adjustments to promotion. Certain things may not be allowed. There's certain humor that is not going to be accepted. You may have to make some changes in how people get things, unconventional ways. You may make some changes to the product itself, maybe changing the ingredients, changing the packaging because the climate may be different. These are all things that you have to consider. Glocalization means a combination of both, is that you keep some elements of standardization, but then you also um, infuse uh, local practices, local customs, uh, things that the locals will be familiar with. It is defined as marketing strategy that involves per pursuing a standardization strategy when possible and an adaptation one when necessary. So you have kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but it's kind of a mixture uh, of strategies. So here are your options. Sell the same domestic product overseas be standardization, modify products for different country, different countries and different regions. That's more of a multinational approach. You're choosing countries and you're changing based upon where you are. You can develop new products for foreign markets and 
you can develop a global product by taking all product differences into one design and develop a global product, a standardized product. So you have a lot of options. So here are the steps for developing new products. And these are actually similar steps that you would find in your Principles of Marketing book. In fact, in our marketing class, we have just gone over this also in chapter 12. And you have similar steps here, uh, slightly different, um, but it's um, pretty much the same. It's the terminologies are, are slightly different. But the first one is you develop ideas. That's obvious. You screen those ideas. You look at the, the, the ideas you have, you evaluate them and you screen them. And then you begin to test the ones that uh, you have chosen. Uh, and then you start crunching the numbers. You, you look at, uh, obviously, revenues and profits. Is this thing profitable? Is it going to make money? You develop prototypes. Then you go into, um, they say market testing. In the marketing book, they say test marketing, where those are synonymous. But in the, in the final analysis, you're moving towards commercialization. So that is the, that is going to be the, path toward developing new products. Hey, you have another graph. This is exhibit 12.3 in the book. That would be page 295. They have a nice little chart here. I actually have one of my own that uh, I would like to, to draw. Uh, I probably will uh, we'll get my whiteboard out, my, my dry board. But let's look at this one first. You have at both ends, both spectrums, low rate of adoption, rapid rate of adoption. What is going to determine that in an in international market are six different elements. The relative advantage that you have in terms of your target country. How compatible are you with your target country? How complex is that market going to be to enter? Can I try this product? Can I test it? Am I able to communicate it through the channels, through the promotion channels? And what is going to be the relative cost? And, and so these are going to be the six elements. And as you can see, based upon um, how these are assessed will determine which way you go. Um, because at one end of the spectrum, you have a low rate of adoption. And those are obviously things that uh, may deter you from entering that market. Product life cycle. You all have seen this. This is on the next slide. From marketing, I always say, you can remember it by saying IGMOD. Introduction growth, maturity, decline, four cycles. Now there's a such thing called the international product life cycle, which is slightly different. And what that does is it tracks a product going from the country that created it through all the other countries that receive it. And what happens to that product as it goes through the international life cycle. Now this product life cycle that you see here, and this is the same one that's in Principles of Marketing. You have the introduction stage, you have the growth stage, you have the maturity stage, and you have the decline stage. And of course, your sales begins to pick up in the growth stage, and it levels off as more competitors come into the market and compete. Then there's a maturity, and then there's a decline, while the product is in the decline stage or in the maturity stage, you want to continue to make some improvements so that that stage is sustained over time. Going back, 
They have product elimination. That is a formal written procedure to determine which of a firm's products should be dropped. Many companies do not have formal product elimination programs, which may be true. They put together crash programs when products get into trouble. Now, I must say that in your marketing book, if you took principles of marketing, uh, you would not have used this book because this is the first semester that uh, we're using this book. But I just want to uh, read to you this idea when they talk about product elimination and they say that many companies do not use um, a formal model, uh, but there are models. There is what is called a product deletion process. And those of you who uh, are taking principles of marketing now, if you can go to three, page 358, you'll see product line review. So you look at the whole product line and you look at which products may need to be contracted or phased out. De deletion analysis. Why is this product being phased out? Are there any good qualities left? Can it be adapted a little? Can we change the packaging? Can we do something to the product to make it the, the perception different? Then you make the decision. Do you delete it? Or do you return it to the product line in an enhanced way? If you delete it, how do you delete it? Do you drop it immediately? Do you run out? Which means that you will continue to run the product based on its strengths that you perceive. Or do you just phase it out evenly over a period of time? So that is the product deletion process. And again, this is from Principles of Marketing. I've show, shown you the diagram so you can uh, refer to it. Uh, but certainly, those are things that you have to uh, consider. I have also included the international product life cycle, uh, again, which is a slightly different model. Where to locate research and development facilities. And I think it's, it's really case-by-case -case basis. Uh, having one facility in the home country reduces R&D costs and exerts more control and coordination over the R&D program. Advantages to having one facility in the home country and one or more facility, additional facilities in foreign markets, the multinational corporation has access to foreign scientists and engineers, which may be cheaper. And not only that, uh, when you talk about new products, you may have resources that may be more plentiful and that may be cheaper uh, for uh, production. New products developed overseas are more likely to be attuned to the firm's overseas markets. There's a very interesting phenomenon that happens. Take a, a fast food company like McDonald's. They have outlets in over 115 countries, maybe 120, 125. And they often get ideas from overseas, things that they see, uh, perhaps menu items or just ideas. Maybe it is the ambiance and the way the McDonald's appears on the inside selling cappuccino, different types of foods, maybe even having a um, coffee bar, uh, which is a uh, uh, McCafe uh, selling cappuccinos just like you would have in a, a Starbucks. So these are types of ideas that are actually brought back to the United States for implementation. So again, you, you have some very interesting uh, exchanges from the foreign office to the home office and, of course, uh, vice versa. Product counterfeiting. There's a video that I show, typically showed in my marketing class, on counterfeiting. 
And we know what counterfeiting is. We've seen it at football games. We've seen it in probably in our cities that we're from. And we may have even unknowingly or knowingly participated in purchasing counterfeit goods because they're cheap. You have someone at the football game selling all of Beyonce's song on one CD or selling um, any number of artists or giving you a DVD of the latest movie. In fact, some movies are still at the theater. Um, I remember years ago, uh, I was at the football game and I was looking around and I see this guy selling DVDs and he was selling a DVD of a movie that was still at the Governor's Square Mall. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this is straight up front bootleg. That's what we called it. You know, bootleg CD. And you're selling this thing for five bucks and you're probably going to make a pretty good margin. But guess what? That is against um, that person's copyright. And, and so there you have that particular law. So you have to uh, obviously be uh, sure that your property is going to be protected uh, when you go into these markets. Of course, advertising is going to be very important. Personal selling, your outlets, which outlets are the most popular depends on the country. Is it billboards, which is true in many places. Billboards are the main source of advertisement. Uh, you have taxi cabs, buses, you have the signs on the side, you have obviously e-marketing, you have television. Radio is a, a very common media, uh, a medium in many, many places, satellite radio. And so what is your media mix? What is it going to be? How, what, what is the percentage? Is it going to be 60% billboard? Is it going to be 10% magazine? 10% newspaper? And is it going to be 20% internet? How will you break it down? Or will it be 40% billboard? Will it be 30% internet? Will it be 20% mobile and 10% print? It's up to you to make the, the, the uh, calculation as to how you distribute the revenue based upon the media that um, you're using in the demographic you're trying to reach. Personal selling is considered very effective in international markets, but there is a high cost per contact. We know what personal selling is. This is more the face-to-face, -face, pressing the flesh, convincing people, uh, selling these products, and ensuring that they uh, understand uh, what the product is, how it works, and the benefits that uh, it will uh, give to the customer. In the book, they also mention a very important concept, page 299. They talk about magazines. Now, okay, magazines are not going to be the top choice for media, media planning. But in many countries, still very important. In fact, I like to show uh, magazines that I purchased from overseas uh, because I think it's very inter interesting to compare and contrast. But they have this concept of magazines, vertical publications versus horizontal publications. So you have vertical publications that are targeted at a specific industry. So you have general industries, you have Forbes, you have... Uh, Bloomberg, you have, um, perhaps you would go with uh, Wall Street Journal uh, and the other publications, uh, Fortune, um, Business Week, um, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, I meant, Fast Company, Entrepreneurship, these are all vertical publications. But then you have uh, horizontal publications, which deal with a specific job in an industry where there'd be something like Brand Week, which is uh, dealing with brand management. Or when, when you deal with um, 
when you talk about salesmanship, there are uh, lots of magazines on uh, sales. Um, there are magazines specifically uh, dealing with um, procurement. And, and, and so these are magazines where you can reach the audience based upon the type of industry that you're, uh, that you're targeting. Sales promotion, again, these may change from country to country. Publicity, you have to be careful about what type of publicity you do and the humor that um, is used in, in some of your, uh, your ad campaigns and your public relations. And you also want to make sure you, that you're a very good uh, corporate citizen. So your publicity is to help firms to prospect for new customers, paves the way for sales calls when favorable press release is sent to prospects ahead of sales calls. Again, the PR, making sure that you have a good face. And maybe you hire locals to be the face of the company. Favorable stories provide objective, unbiased, third-party endorsement for a firm. Um, if you do corporate social responsibility, that may help you get to the point where you have that positive press. And of course, your channels of distribution. Channel is what it suggests, the length of your supply chain going from procurement to distribution and then, at, and then support, support services at the very end. So you're looking at which channels, how long is your channel, how many nodes are you going to have in your channel from the manufacturer to the buyer? Are you going through retail? Are you going through wholesale, retail, another retail, and then consumer? Are you just going from manufacturer to consumer or are you using just wholesalers? What is going to be the structure of your supply chain or your distribution channel? Is it going to be physical? Is it going to be virtual? All good questions. Okay, so for this channels of distribution, we have indirect and direct strategy. Uh, and indirect strategy are those methods that you're going to use that have already been charted uh, in your home country that you seek to use in other markets. So it says uses existing distribution channels to market products and services. So this may be the export strategy. And of course you can use different methods once you get the product to that foreign market. You can use distributors, you can use agents, intermediaries to carry your product. Then you have the direct strategy where you bypass existing channels by using marketing and sales offices located in foreign countries. So this may be through the, uh, we talk about uh, foreign direct investment or you talk about buying a company in that foreign market, 51%, in which you can now route your products uh, through that channel so that uh, you can have uh, a lot better chance of succeeding by using an existing uh, structure, uh, but then uh, moving your product through that supply chain uh, and thus maintains control over marketing efforts. You have a number of different types of distribution agents, which connects buyers and sellers and distributors which sell on the behalf of a manufacturer for a, obviously, a, uh, at a discount. Then you have physical distribution. Lots of different challenges when you talk about physical distribution, most notably in developing countries, you have to look at the road system. You have to look at the traffic. When I was in the Manila, Philippines, Eight o'clock at night, I was out and we, we were actually 
driving, I think, to the hotel. And there was a, another um, night that I was just walking in Manila. And it was the traffic. It was just like a parking lot. It was 8 o'clock at night. And it was a parking lot. And I was thinking, this can't be. This traffic is horrible. And what, what we found out in Manila is that they did a very poor job of accommodating the growth of the city and did not do a lot of, um, when you talk about city planning and laying down the public works projects, the expressways and the roadways and all of that to take pressure off of the main arteries, then that was something that it, they admitted that perhaps they didn't plan as they should have in terms of the road system. So that traffic was just brutal. And I felt it. And I was merely just a visitor. So it was it was something else. So when you go to these countries, you have to look at that. You have to look at the distribution channels. You have to look at the types of distribution channels. Is it going to be roadway? Uh, is it going to be using um, alternative methods? Is it going to be, um, you talk about people using kiosks in different locations? Is it going to be a storefront? Is it going to be hiring somebody on a bicycle to take your goods um, to point B if the road uh, structure is bad? Are you going to use scooters and motorcycles? Uh, these are all options. Or are you going to have people selling your products on the street? Uh, probably not, but that is another way that products are move in uh, a lot of these developing countries. You see these street vendors moving back and forth selling these products. How can you get your products to point B? You can use freight forwarders. We talked about time versus cost. So you're looking at your product, the type of product you have, whether it's perishable or whether it's non-perishable, is going to determine what mode that uh, you're going to use to get there. If it is a perishable product, you may need to do one of two things. You can use a faster route or you can somehow package your product in a way that it is preserved in getting there. So those are also options. Containerization. You've seen these containers on ships. They're stacked up. You've seen them on back of trains. You've seen them on the back of a 18-wheeler. So the cargo is what makes it an 18-wheeler. And you've seen these trucks taking cargo across the highway. And then you have intermodal transport, which is you're trying to figure out the most efficient way to get your products from point A to point B. So the first leg, you might use a sea cargo getting to the port. You get to the port, a truck comes, and they get the products from the seaport, take them to a distribution center. In that distribution center, they have these couriers that are on motorbikes and that will take the products to their destination. And so you have intermodal transport, which handles that. Now, I'm not sure if, um, you know, many of these companies will, will say, OK, well, this is the best way is the motor scooter. Um, you would have to have a mighty small parcel, but you'd be surprised when I was in Vietnam. Some of these motor scooters had big bundles of merchandise that they were carrying and I don't know where they were going, probably some business, but I mean, these are huge, huge bundles that they're carrying on these motor scooters. So that is perhaps a reality that you can have that as part of the relay race of getting your products from point A to point B. I'm going to begin to wind down. Um, we talk about um, pricing, pricing objectives. Of course, we have to look at the bottom line, that's why you're over there, right? You're over there to make a profit. You're there to provide a product. You're there to provide a service. And you will look at these as these um, 
in the supply chain, the supply chain has to be optimized. And when the supply chain is optimized, then these pricing considerations have already been taken into account. And then here you would have the, the idea of how that product is, uh, is going to be assessed going forward. And here is a measurement. Looking at net profit, return on investment, market share, market penetration. You look at prevention objectives. Preempting the competition by perhaps making the product more expensive. And after having a subsidized product, you've gotten a grant, you've gotten a low interest loan, you've got technical assistance coming in, you can price the product lower, which preempts competition from coming in because they can't compete. You're also looking at things like developing those supplier relationships, tying up the, the best supplier so that your competition can't get in. That's another way of, of doing it. Setting prices, maybe use the law of one price. Law of one price is that if it's $2 here, it's $2 everywhere else. You just adjust the exchange rate. If your currency is $1 to two units of theirs, if it costs $2 here, it's, two, it's four units there. If the exchange rate is $1 to 50 units, if it's $2 here, it's 100 units in that other market. But you may have to make some adjustments depending on your target segment. Maybe the economics will not allow you to keep that nice parity and you might have to go down a little bit on the pricing. Of course, demand conditions are also very, very important. So here's what I was talking about, law of one price, where you can have different prices, gray market, gray markets and dumping. Just simply dumping means that you're bringing products over and you're undercutting the locals on price. Gray market goods are, are very different. It reads here, unauthorized importers selling a product in the manufacturer's domestic market for less than the manufacturer sells the product in that market. So you have a lot of different markets. You have your traditional markets. You have your black markets, which uh, tend to be totally illegal. You have unauthorized importers. Now that product is authorized to be in that country and distributed, but you might not have a license to do it. And so that becomes a gray market because while the product is allowed in that country, you have others who are not authorized to deliver it. Dumping again is this idea of selling a product at a price below the market average. Then you have transfer pricing. As you're dealing with subsidiaries overseas, selling them products that they will resell. So you have to account for the differences in exchange rate. I didn't realize this until I went to a conference and there was a professor who gave a talk on the military and he talked about how the military hedged they use the hedging strategies because they're operating it in and out of different currencies and I didn't think of that until I saw that presentation arms lift price a price that the overseas market is willing to pay or price that is customarily paid for the transfer of product in the overseas market and that can be a lot of things that can have to do with what stage that product is in in the product life cycle in that country. What can be in the decline phase here can be in the maybe introduction stage in other countries. So you have maybe a different price uh, strategy. When the market is saturated and prices decline here, the price is lower. In other countries, there's a scarcity, so prices are higher. So you have some variation there. So that is going to do it for chapter 12. We're at an hour and I wanted to cover chapter 13 and it looks like I will have to cover that um, 
over the weekend in a different video because I want to keep these at about an hour and give you time to do a short quiz. And I will do that now. Uh, so proceed to the quiz. It's only a few questions, so make sure you take it and um, make sure that you also check for chapter 13 on distribution. Uh, the exact title of the article is Global Operations and Supply Chain Management. That is a very important and very interesting topic. So again, uh, proceed to the quiz and make sure you take it. And I'll see you on next week. Take care.